That was pathetic. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the first chapel of the 23-24 school year. I am really excited to, to see all of you guys in this room. I'm excited about what God's going to do this semester. Uh, I'm really excited about, uh, about this time that we get to get together every week and we get to express to God a response to all of the good things that he has done in our lives and all the good things that we know he is going to do. Um, and so I'm going to ask you to bow with me for a quick prayer. Uh, Ryan and Esther uh, and, and their crew are going to lead us in some musical worship, and then we'll uh, continue with our morning worship of God. So bow with me. God, we love you, and we want you to hear that loud and clear this morning, first thing from us. We love you, and we are thankful that you give us the privilege of getting to be able to gather together to express to you our response to what you have done. God, we ask that you would uh, take what we do here, that you would find it pleasing. We ask that you would uh, fill uh, this space and this time with your spirit, and that you would lead us uh, to wherever you would have us to go. God, we pray all of these things this morning in your name, and in the name of your son, Jesus, who is alive right now today. Amen.
is about starting a new year is there's a lot of new faces, right? And you introduce yourself and you hear their name and then you forget it and then hopefully you learn it again, right? But hopefully over time you begin to build a relationship because you spend time together and you kind of learn about them and their character and who they are and sometimes you make just lifelong friendships and relationships, right? Uh, I think as we gather for worship each Tuesday, part of what we're doing is we are getting to know God better. We are drawing closer to him. We're, we're learning more about him, who his character is, and what he's about, and, and asking him to transform us to be more like him. Our next song is new, at least to those who are returning on campus. Um, it's called This Is Our God, and it makes some strong statements about who God is to remind us or teach us as we seek to get to know him better.
so much that we could come here together today to praise you as a community and I pray that you just open our hearts today to hear the message and that I pray that you will speak through Brian today and I pray that you will motivate us to get through this semester strong and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody. My name is Brian Baldwin. I am the new Dean of Students here at Great Lakes Christian College. I am really excited to share with you this morning um, and to get started uh, in, this, in this semester. I know that God's going to do great things. Um, I'm starting to meet some of you guys. I haven't, uh, I haven't uh, met everyone yet. Um, if I ask you your name multiple times, it's not you, it's me. Um, and, uh, and we will absolutely get there. Um, I want to talk to you today. I, I've got three stories I want to tell you, um, and uh, uh, they're they're loosely connected. They're animal stories, um, and at the end, I want to kind of illustrate what I think those are telling us about this semester and about you. You are in one of these stories somewhere. One of these applies to you. I also want to say I I I think probably most of the students on this campus fall into one of, of three broad categories, not to label you, and you may, you may be an outlier and a, and, a, and a crazy rebel that doesn't fit into any of this, and, and that's fine. But I think probably there are people on this campus who are Christ followers. By Christ follower, I mean you are organizing your life, you're organizing your future, you're organizing your day-to-day -day in such a way that you are becoming uh, closer and closer to uh, living a lifestyle that looks like that, that looks like the kind of stuff that Jesus would do, that Jesus, uh, avoiding stuff Jesus wouldn't do, um, and, and that that's a, a central part of your identity and who you are. Some of you in here are Christ believers. You believe Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. You, you really would like to not go to hell, um, maybe, and, uh, and you believe that, but it's not necessarily, it doesn't necessarily have an impact on, like, your day-to-day -day decision making or what you're going to do for a living or how you spend money or where you spend your relationship and some of you in here might be uh, uh, neither of those uh, maybe you are someone who's uh, who's uncertain um, and so you're you know you're sort of uh, Christ iffy um, I'm not sure what I think about all this stuff and uh, and you are a great place to start asking some of those questions and figure some of that out some of you in here might be anti all this Jesus stuff. Don't want anything to do with it. I just want to get my degree or, or, or be here for whatever reason that I'm here and deal with that. And, and that's fine. I want to let you know, I'm, I'm, we, are, we are open to all of you. And hopefully, all of you will find a place in the stories that I want to tell you today. Hopefully, those will all connect to you. I want to talk about some stuff. These, the three stories I'm going to share with you today are things that I think are good for us to, they're, they're good images, they're good parables for us to have as we start off our semester. Um, one of the cool things about college, whether you are a returning <coughs> student or brand new or a transfer, is that every semester has the opportunity to be brand new. Every, especially in the fall, you know, everything has the opportunity to be brand new. This is a great opportunity to go, I know how I did things last time, or I know how I think things were gonna go, now I get a chance to rewrite some of that, start fresh, in a way that many people never get the chance to do as often as college students do. So, uh, so with that said, I want to talk to you first of all about an, an animal called the rhinoceros. How many of you have ever seen it? Like, hands up. How many of you have ever seen a rhinoceros like in real life? You know, massive things. A rhino, uh, and there are different you know, species and types of rhinoceros, but they, they tend to be about, you know, about this high at the shoulder, um, and they can, uh, they can weigh in uh, at, at over 5,000 pounds. Some of the biggest uh, are, are a little under 8,000 pounds. Um, they've got a hide that is thick enough that most rifles won't penetrate it. Any, anybody in here is a hunter, whatever you're using to hunt deer, that's not going to work on rhinos. Um, uh, that's going to use them. Um, so you have this massive animal, weighs 5,000 pounds, has armor, you know, armor-proof hide. Um, they have the, the that big horn on their nose, which is actually made out of compressed air. It's hair. 
Um, and, and yet, it is so solid, it's so strong, that uh, we have multiple, uh, 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 multiple uh, uh, observations of them penetrating uh, like Land Rover doors. Um, like vehicle doors with the horn. They can flip a Land Rover without thinking about it. Top speed, here's what I want you to get. Top speed on this animal is 35 miles an hour. 5,000 pounds, armored, giant armor-piercing nose, 35 miles an hour. Visual acuity, visual clarity, 30 feet. Feet. Do you know what you call a group of rhinos? A crash. <laughs> a crash of rhinos. <clears throat> There's a whole sermon in that, but I want to file that away. You got the rhino? Can I come back to that in a little bit? You know, 5,000 pounds, armored, piercing, uh, 35 miles an hour, only sees 30 feet. Um, so, so this is just a, a giant accident waiting to happen. Uh, the next story is going to be a little bit longer. It has to do with tigers. My, my youngest brother. Um, uh, and if you want a lot of good stories about my, my youngest brother, talk to Sam Long. Um, my youngest brother calls me up one night and he's like, I just watched this documentary. I haven't seen the documentary. This is my, my youngest brother's version of it. Um, but these guys decided that they wanted to reintroduce tigers into this space where tigers had become extinct. And so they got this, there, there was this preserve that was working with them. And so uh, they get these two juvenile male tigers and they're like we're going to raise these tigers to live in the wild and see if we can get them to do that because tigers in the wild you just release them they die little ones they die older ones they, they also die they don't know how to feed themselves so uh so these guys are like okay and no one had ever done this before so there's no playbook for this does that make sense there's no like well here's what you do day one so they're making it up as they go so the first thing they do is they're like, all right, we gotta, we gotta teach them how to hunt. So they take this antelope carcass and, uh, and they lay it out there and they start teaching these cubs to pounce on it. The problem is they can't let the, the tigers eat it yet. They had to go through this whole process of, of how to find it and how to, how to chase them and then how to pounce. And that. So the first step was just getting them to pounce on it. So they're getting them to do that. But then what they have to do is take the, the meat away from them and then feed them something else later. So that's the first step. This is fine until a couple months in when the tiger weighs 450 pounds. And now you've got this 145 pound you know, ranger dude who's like, aha, and the tiger pounces on it and the guy grabs it and the tiger's like, mm. you know, and, and, and you can see this guy going, I, I hope this guy, this this animal never realizes I also am food um, that, that you could eat. Um, and so this works uh, uh, pretty good. And then they start taking and they're, they're, they, they put the tigers out and they run by them with an antelope carcass, just dragging it. And the tiger pounce on it. They go, okay, so that's, that's really cool. But then that, that wasn't moving fast enough because antelope were super quick. So they, they, they run a zip line and now they got antelope one and the tiger pounced on it and, and that was really cool and then they went still gotta go faster so they they figure out we'll we'll tie this to the back of one of the jeeps and drive around the compound and then out of nowhere just two little you know uh adolescent tigers like oh we got you and and they did that and that was great until they realized that once every couple of weeks the mailman comes from town a couple of hours away in a jeep <laughs> that now has tigers going, oh, food. So mailman is like, ah, and throwing mail out and driving home real quick. Um, and then finally, they, they, they figured out these animals could now, could now find their prey. They could eat. They could, they could take care of themselves. And so these men were really excited. So they, they, they had, uh, had seeded, they, they put in the, uh, the preserve uh, uh, like 40 or 50 animals, uh, 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 a whole herd that could populate itself and have two predators in the area and everything like, like the ecosystem would be stable so they let the they let the two tigers out and in 24 hours they killed all 50 antelope working together for fun and so the guy's like so we made serial killer tigers <laughs> 
And I tell you that story to tell you this. These guys are figuring out that teaching tigers to be tigers is way harder and more complicated than they thought it was. And if you do it wrong, you teach tigers to be monsters. So you got the rhinos, right? Giant armor piercing, huge tanks with only 30 feet of visual acuity and 35 mile an hour top speed. Tigers that don't know how to be tigers, and if you teach them wrong, they become monsters. Last story, and then we'll loop back around and I'll tell you what I think this stuff means, why I'm telling you these. So the, the, the third story is they did an experiment with a couple of different species of monkey. Um, and the, the different species that they, they looked at, they gave, they gave them all these tests to figure out how good they were at problem solving. And most of them were pretty good at problem solving. I don't know how many of you have ever done missions trip or vacation or anything to a place where there were monkeys. Um, my wife tells stories about being um, uh, overseas and and uh, when we were in North Africa, there were there were some uh, monkeys in the park that we went to, and uh, monkeys are terrifyingly good at solving problems, especially when you have food and therefore you are the problem, um, and they are trying to solve that. Um, and so uh, uh, they, they, these monkeys are really good at solving problems, and then they gave them the last one. And the last puzzle is this. There's a plexiglass wall, and it's got a little hole in it, and the monkey can just get its hand through if it kind of squinches it up, sticks it into the other side. You guys got it? And then they would put the favorite fruit, banana or a monkey fruit or whatever, on the other side of that. Monkey would grab it, and then what does the monkey try to do? Tries to pull his hand back, right? Except now he's got a handful of monkey fruit. And so when he comes back, he hits that hole, he can't go through, and these monkeys lost their minds. They went bonkers. Um, just uh, to the point where they had to like come in and intervene to keep the monkey from hurting itself trying to get its hand back and feeling trapped. Got that image in your head? Rhinoceroses, rhinoceroi, rhinos, rhinos um, and, and tigers, and monkeys, oh my. Um, <clears throat> so where are you in this? Why am I telling you this stuff? Um, I think at the beginning of the semester, many of you guys are living like in a lot of ways, one of these stories. Here's the first one. That, that rhino, that rhinoceros is a, a, just an image of power, of raw power. If you are in a Land Rover and the rhino decides, I want you to be upside down, there's nothing you can do to stop that from happening in the short term. If, you are, if you're close enough to it and it can see you, and it decides, I would like for that thing to be flying down the road, that's what's going to happen. You know what I mean? This is not a thing that you can fight with. Once it has decided the thing is so, and it is able to act on it, it is so. And here's the reality. Everybody in this room, you are, according to uh, the psalmist, fearfully and wonderfully made. You, you were created in the very image of the Creator. You were created in the image of God. Let me tell you a secret, those of you who don't know the Christ story very well. You don't know the God story very well. The only reason you exist is because the God who created everything thought you, in the, in the way that he envisioned you, were cool enough to hang out with. That's it. That's the end. You were cool enough to hang out with. That's the whole point of the story. You were made, and it's like, I, I'd love to hang out with a one of those, and that's the goal. Some of you in here don't think you have power. Some of you have been told all your life you're a bad student, and therefore you think you're a bad student. Some of you have been told that there are things in your life that you have no power to change that you do. Some of you think your words don't matter. Some of you think your, uh, your emotions don't matter. Some of you think your ability to impact your future it doesn't matter. Some of you think you will never be able to overcome whatever that thing was that happened to you. You think you have no power, and I am telling you, you have immense power, incredible power, power beyond belief, simply because of whose image you carry. You have incredible power. The question is, do you have the sight to see it? Great power with bad eyesight is a recipe for disaster. 
Some of you don't think you have the power to overcome your worry and anxiety. And in dealing with that specific issue, Jesus says in Matthew, in the Sermon on the Hill, chapter 6, talking about possessions. I'm not going to read all of it, but uh, when he's talking about like uh, uh, stuff that we have and the anxiety that can cause and worrying about tomorrow, and do we have enough power to impact that? And Jesus says, your eyes like a lamp that provides light for your body. Eye is healthy, whole body's filled with light. When your eye is unhealthy, whole body's filled with darkness. And if the light you think you have is actually darkness, how deep that darkness really is. So here's my first thing. Maybe you are in here and that is you. You need to get some clarity of vision. Why am I at this school? Why am I with the people that I am with? Why am I playing this sport? Why am I taking these classes? Why am I in this major? Why am I here? What is God doing right now in my calling? What is God doing right now in my lifestyle? What is God doing right now in my relationships? And you need to get some vision from God so that you can unleash your power in the right direction. Let me tell you something. I, I, your faculty and staff are here at this place because we think investing in, in college students, investing in you, changes everything. We, we see your power. And, and we, we know what happens when it gets channeled poorly. We also know what happens. And those, what happens if we could get your visual acuity to 150 feet and then point you at problems? What would that look like? Tigers. Tigers don't have to be tigers. If you read the biblical story, you realize that as a result of stuff that happened really early on, the whole Adam and Eve thing, people don't really know how to be people right. Humans don't know how to human very well. We are designed to learn how to be humans. And if you are a Christ follower, you are designed to need to learn how to be a Christ follower. Jesus spent a tremendous amount of time training people to train people how to be people. I'll say it again. Jesus trains people how to train people how to be people. That's discipleship. I used to ask students this all the time in, uh, in some of the classes I taught. I would go, listen, what did Jesus come to do? And all the churchy people would say, Jesus came to save the lost. And there's a verse that says, Jesus came to seek the lost. And, and then I would go, guys, that was a weekend. What was the rest of the three years for? Oh, it was to train up people, to train people how to be people who are following Christ. That's, that's the thing. You are like that. And you know what those guys needed, those tiger guys needed? They needed a tiger who could become a human and figure out how to teach the humans how to teach tigers. Or a human who could become a tiger and teach the tigers how to be tigers. What Christ did, I will come, I will be you. And then you can see who the Father really is. You can see who God really is and what he's trying to connect you to be. So what does that mean for you guys? Listen, God has always, always maneuvered, always strategized, always created people who impacted each other to do whatever it was that he was trying to do. Always he has done this. And it is no different. You are not here on accident. One of the things that God is doing this semester you're going to be sitting in classes with people that may be, may be of great importance to your future. You may be sitting next to someone. You may be living next to someone, with someone in the dorm. And you are of great importance to their future. You may be in a place right now where somebody is teaching you how to tiger better. And you need to be as wise as possible to select who you follow. Because being a serial killer tiger is not plan A. Hey, let's destroy all of our food day one. You know, let's, that, that's not plan A. Let's, let's not make decisions that are going to wreck our lives because we learned how to be people from people who didn't know what they would do. 
And so you have an opportunity now here at the beginning, at the get-go, to start figuring out who do I need to be following? Who do I need to be around? Who do I need to be investing in? What relationships do I need to make priorities? How am I going to learn how to be a tiger? So let me give you two practical tips. Number one, show me your immediate friends and I'll show you your immediate future. And, and, and this is a truth that's been alive for so long, um, it, 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 it sells itself. Show me your immediate friends, your immediate influencers, and I will show you your immediate future. Um, I, I, I have had to fire friends. Has anyone else had to do that? Because they were not fulfilling their job requirements. Um, they, they, were, they were not leading me in a direction that was going to be healthy for me. Um, I've had to make some changes with that. So if you do that, let me give you three people. If you are a Christ follower, three people you need to have in your life. I'm going to do this for Christ believers and, and those who, who aren't either of those things here in a minute. But if you're a Christ follower, you need to have three people in your life. You need to have a Paul. The Apostle Paul, this is a guy who uh, the, the New Testament is, is comprised of books, most of which are uh, about Jesus and what he did and what his life looked like and, and what he taught. And then his followers trying to figure out how to solve problems together that come from living together, trying to follow Jesus. Paul's one of the guys that writes on that side of it. And, and one of the things uh, uh, that, that he does, he model, and you can see in his life, modeling is, is uh, uh, Paul finds people who are younger than him in the faith, and he, and he grows them up. You need a Paul, someone older than you in the faith, who knows what they're doing following Jesus, that you can look at and say, teach me what you've got in your life that I need in mine. You, you need a Paul. You need some people that have access and authority. You catch that? Access and authority. They've got to have access to your life. They've got authority when they go... Hey, we need to rethink this. Hey, this is really good. You need to double down and keep doing this. They've got that. You need a Paul in your life. You also need a Timothy, one of Paul's protégés. He's really young when he gets started, um, and he trains him up to do the same stuff Paul was doing. Is a, is a kid named Timothy. You need people younger in the faith um, that 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 are are not quite there yet. But you're coming alongside, going, Hey, let me show you what I've learned about how prayer works. Let me show you what I, uh, I've learned about what happens when you're trying to communicate with God and it feels like he's just not there and you don't have any emotional attachment to this thing. Um, uh, let me show you what I've learned about worship. Let me show you what I've learned about uh, uh, getting work done and how that becomes worship. Um, you, need a, you need a Timothy. Um, if you don't have a Paul, you will come, become spiritually anemic, like spiritually emaciated, spiritually starved. Because you won't have enough pouring into you. And if you don't have, if you don't have a Paul, you'll have that. If you don't have a Timothy, you'll become spiritually constipated because nothing's coming out. Both of those will kill you. So you need to have somebody you're also pouring out to. And then you need a Barnabas. Barnabas is this dude, um, just to paraphrase uh, or to, to kind of give you the short story. Uh, this guy, Paul, I told you about, he starts off as pretty much a terrorist. Um, and then he gets converted and decides to want to come to the people that he's been terrifying and go, hey, I'm one of you now, so show me all your secret hiding places and who's your leadership. And they kind of legitimately went, or maybe not, you know, <laughs> do that. Um, and Barnabas is the guy who went, I'll take him, I'll teach him. Barnabas is a nickname that means son of encouragement. Dude, if encouragement had a kid, it would look like you. That's Barnabas. Barnabas and Paul then uh, go, go side by side doing kind of mission trips, and doing what they do. You need Barnabai, which I've decided is the plural for Barnabas. Don't ask any of your Greek professors about that. But for right now, that's what it means. Barnabai, it, uh, these are the people who are your peers who are about the same age as you in Christ, that are following with you, that can give you that encouragement. I tell you, I don't know the answer to that either, but I'll stand beside you till we find it. You need those things. Here's all, here's all I'm asking. As tigers, as incredibly powerful entities that need to be trained how to use that power for good and not evil, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm begging you, take advantage of the community God has poured you into. Because it is not an accident that we are all here. This mix of people in this room for this semester is not an accident. Look to what God is doing how God is planning up to teach you. And here's the last one. 
What are you holding that looks really good, but it's trapped you? What are you holding and it looks really good, but it's trapped you? In Hebrews chapter 11 and 12, 11 lists all these people that are heroes in the faith that we ought to look at. Look at what God did in this guy's life. Look what God did with her. Look what God did with them. And then it says at the beginning of 12, uh, of Hebrews 12, but because of all of these witnesses, we need to let go of whatever it is that's hindering us and, and pursue the things that God has us chasing at. What are you hanging on to? It's a toxic relationship. Maybe it's a toxic friendship and you feel like without it, you're nothing. You don't know who you are without that person in your life. And that person is poisoning you. Let it go. It's the addiction, the website you don't want to go on to. You just keep going back there. You know where that leads. It's the decision that you, you know you don't want to make. And you just keep waking up every morning going, again. How did I do that again? Maybe it's a view of yourself. I'm too much this or not enough that. I don't know what it is that you're hanging on to. And it looks so attractive. But there's this thing you can't see that's keeping you. You just let go. You be free. And there's so much more. I don't know what that is. But I know this. I know today, the beginning of this semester, before we're not, we're not, we're not even three days into classes. Does that make sense? We're, we're, we're not even uh, starting games into the season. We're not even at the beginning of hanging out with your roommates and your friend groups. It's all just getting started. If you would just be conscious and aware of how powerful your life is, how gifted God is enabling you to be, of how important your words can be, of, of how important your love can be, of how important <coughs> just your identity, just who you are, just as you, not for what you can do, not for what you can provide for somebody else, just because God made you. If you would just open your eyes to that, if you would just let Christ show you what all that means, you would let him do that through the people around you. You would find the people who are producing the fruit in their life that looks like Jesus, that sounds like Jesus, that moves like Jesus. And you would find those places that God is designing around you right now. And if you would just let go of whatever, and I don't know what it is, but I bet you do. You're trapped and flailing and hurting yourself because you are trapped. You know what it is. And here's the secret. You may not be able to let go of that by yourself. You may not be able to clearly see, like the rhino, what it is by yourself. And that's why we need to have people teach us how to be fighters. And so, all of us in here have a decision to make. Decision time isn't like where I now go every head bowed, every eye closed, and you decide whether you want to become a Christ follower. Although, that is a perfectly legitimate option, and I would be thrilled if you did so. But I think if God has done what God usually does, God's spirit has been in the songs we've sung, the prayers we've prayed, the, the conversations we've had, the words that I have spoken, the words of scripture that you've heard, paraphrased or read, then if we've really encountered God today, it's really hard to encounter God and go away the same. It's really hard to do that. And so what's your decision? What are you going to do? What are you going to do with what has been presented to you today? Are you going to decide to take this semester and take the time and the moment to lean into God and ask, what do you have for me? Who do you have for me? Where do you want me to plug in? not? Are you going to be 5,000 pounds bulletproof and blah? It is my hope that we will create as many options and opportunities for you to figure out 
what it is God's doing for you this semester. And I hope that, that these services will be a key part of that. So as we go forward, I'm going to ask, if you have a decision to make and, you're, and you've decided something in here has sparked you, you're feeling in your mind, it doesn't have to be emotional, if you're thinking in your mind or you're feeling, it might be emotional, in, in, in your emotions, there may be a response I need to make for this. Do not escape this space without grabbing someone that you know follows Christ and ask them what you should do about it. Because when we don't do that, then that, that thought just kind of wanders away in our head and nothing happens. So I'm going to ask you if you would please pray with me. And then I've got a couple of announcements, so don't get up and go. And then, uh, and then we will move on with our day. Father, we love you. God, I thank you for, uh, mostly for these students here that have come and filled this space and have made this campus uh, fully alive again. God, I thank you that you have called them here. I thank you that they have honored your request to be in this space at this time. I pray that you would honor their request, that you would make this time worthwhile for them. You would make this time valuable for them. I pray that your spirit would move in each of their lives in such a way that they would know who you are and who that makes them. God, whatever it is that they need to see, whoever it is that they need to invest in or be invested in, whoever, whatever it is that they need to let go of, I pray that you would bring that clue to their mind, and I pray that you would give them the power to be able to respond to what you've asked them to do. God, we, we pray all of this today in your name and in the name of your son, Jesus, who is alive right now, today.